Sejam muito bem-vindos a mais um vídeo do Combo Infinito. Eu sou o Ariel. Hoje nós vamos passar aqui por um vídeo aprofundado do jogo Avald do Xbox e que a gente pode ter uma visão diferente agora do game, porque eles explicaram muitas coisas. É um vídeo longo, eu vou acompanhar o vídeo inteiro com vocês, eu decidi que eu não vou fazer um resumo, eu vou acompanhar tudo para eu poder ter uma noção exata do que eles estão querendo para o game, que é um jogo que está ficando bastante questionado por conta da parte técnica, mas eu não duvido que o jogo vai ser um grande, um grande game, não. Mas antes, você está no... Come on! Sim, você ouviu o barulho do clique, porque aqui a gente faz tudo sem edição. Vamos lá para começar a assistir este vídeo agora. Games in this podcast range from E to M. É um podcast, mano. Olha aí. Hello and welcome back to the official Xbox podcast. My name is Tina Amini. I'm here with my fellow co-host Jeff Rubenstein, but we also have two very, very special guests for this very special relatively shorter uh, podcast episode. We have Carrie Patel here from Obsidian as well as Gabe Paramo from Obsidian. Can you guys introduce yourselves just briefly what you do at Obsidian? Eu vou dando Obsidian pause onde eu achar que precisa, beleza? My name is Carrie Patel. I've been at Obsidian for over 10 years now and I'm the game director of Avowed. My name is Gabe Paramo. I'm the gameplay director and I've been at Obsidian for about five years. Eu não sabia que, a, que o Avowed tinha uma diretora. Muito legal. We'll, de we'll delve into those roles a little yes. bit, uh, but first we're actually recording this a little behind the scenes here, yeah. right before the Dev Direct goes live. Like, how does it feel like you're just about to share a vow with the world? It's so exciting. I mean, I know the team has put so much hard work into this game and we're going to get to see a little bit of that in some of the footage we're looking at today. And so it's really rewarding knowing all the love and polish that's gone into this to finally get to show people where a vow is headed. It was very cool um, being down at Irvine filming with you guys for Developer Direct. So I got to be behind the scenes and it was it was very fun to see the office, to see everybody um, busy working, but also excited to present um, about the game. And we're going to, in a, just a minute, see actually some extended footage from the Developer Direct. So it's very exciting. Um, but let's talk Vamos about Aora first então. because we are in Aora. Um, we, that's part of a world that you guys have built previously for the Pills of Eternity uh, universe. So we know that, that, that that's very Obsidian-like, of course, but in, in Developer Direct, you both talked about Obsidian's pedigree and like what makes Avowed a very Obsidian game. So what, aside from Aora and that context and building off of the Pillars universe, what would you both say makes it an Obsidian game? For me, it's really about our player-centric approach to role play. Um, our studio's motto is your world's your way. And so the way we really approach choice and consequence and everything else is just giving players opportunities to define who they are in this world, how, how they want to behave, like just what fantasy, what challenges they want to undertake. And so with all of the content we design, whether it's quests, companion relationships, or gameplay, which Gabe can talk to, we really try to create this player-shaped hole so that we're always leaving room for players to really step in, drive the game and the story forward, and just define who they are in this setting. Yeah, from the gameplay perspective, right, if you look at Grounded, Grounded is uh, your world, your way, you get to build whatever world you want. Uh, in the context of, of Avowed, right, we've We've tried to, to lean into that with the gameplay mechanics and sort of let the player, through the loadout system, through what companions you can choose, through the abilities they can choose, they're throwable that they can select, right? Just what does the player want to do uh, for combat and being able to support that uh, in as many ways as possible. So in the Dell, in the Dev Direct, you, you kind of swoop through very quickly. There's a lot there to take in. So as Tina said, we have some extended footage here and we're actually gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna bust out our telestrators and we're gonna <laughs> pause and say, okay, well, what do we just see here? So why don't we roll some of that footage and, and let's get into it. All right, so tell us, uh, where in the game is, is this area? When, how do you encounter it even? So this is Shatterscarp, which is the third region in the game. Um, but what we're exploring here is just one tiny little adventure space in one corner of the region. And is this something you could even like miss? Is this an, an optional area or something you're definitely going to hit? It's absolutely missable. Um, mm. You know, discoverability and letting players be the authors of their own experience is obviously very important to us. So the content you're seeing here, the quest you're encountering, the little stories and nuggets of adventures you're finding, that's really for players who, who go out and seek it out. 
So exploration gets rewarded, of course, and this is, from my understanding, a side quest too. So it's definitely something you can stumble on, decide to partake in or not. Um, but I'm curious, who are these enemies? Because I feel like we just wandered into their territory and it's just a family having a good old time and, yeah, yeah. and we're, we're just killing them out of nowhere. So who are these enemies and why do we hate them? <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't think we hate them, uh, actually. <laughs> um, they're, they're fine. It's more that they, they just don't really, they're our Zorups, right? They're from Pillars of Eternity. They don't really speak a language that we can understand, but they're very uh, territorial, mm -hmm. um, right? So you've you've stepped on their space. You know they're trying to get back their territory in this area, and yeah, they're just gonna take down whatever gets in their way. Can I just call it. We've confirmed swimming. Swimming is part of this game now. <laughs> yeah. What is that? It's confirmed. Almost not um, but but speaking of enemies, you know, as we're going through this area, I'm just Got curious. It. Confirmed. Oh. Um, but but speaking of Essa enemies, animação. you know, as we're it's part of this game now. Ele puxando <laughs> o boneco. Ali o confirmed. boneco não sente, um, but, but, ó. Olha lá. We've confirmed ele swimming. Ele vem do mesmo jeito que ele estava segurando, segurando o negócio. Isso daí é uma coisa que, que eles um, precisam but, dar uma melhoradinha. But speaking of enemies, you know, as we're going through this area, I'm just curious. What are the other types of enemies that you might encounter, and what is that difficulty progression look like? Because I know we're about midway yeah. through here, um, but perhaps later in the game, what does that look like? Um, well, we've shown off ogres and we've shown off, you know, big, scary looking bears. Yep. Um, but yeah, we, we have our, uh, archetypes, right? So like uh, healers and, uh, you know, brute melee characters, brute range, people that are trying to use, you know, magic, uh, you know, melee attacks, right? So uh, yeah, just a, a bunch of variety of enemies that you can... Uh, fight and have to use the, the gameplay mechanics in order to defeat. Yeah. So there was a lot yeah. of stuff in the combat that actually I want to go back to. So if we, can, if we can back that video up and go back to that first encounter. Speaking of gameplay mechanics. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um comentário rápido, eu gosto muito da exploração que tem no Outer Worlds, novamente, não é um jogo que eu tenha terminado ainda, mas eu quero muito voltar para o jogo, porque não foi um jogo que eu avaliei, jogos que eu não avaliei, como a gente tem muito review durante o ano, acaba que a gente fica muito atrasado nos jogos que a gente não revisou, né? O Aleptex pegou a maior parte dos jogos que ele, que ele revisou, ele terminou, é, todos os jogos que ele revisou, ele terminou, e eu não, e alguns eu preciso correr atrás, o Outer Worlds é um deles. É, e o Outer Worlds, ele tem essa vibe de exploração, decisão e tudo, e eu vejo muito disso no, no Avald. Eu acho que esse vai ser o grande cerne do jogo, uma ampli, amplificação do que eles fizeram no Outer Worlds, sabe? Cara, por que não tá dando? Eu tenho algumas perguntas aqui. Ok. So you're armed. I see you, you immediately yeah. you pull out a, a sword and a shield. It looked like there was a, a, a parry move that yeah. uh, the player uses here. I'll like parry. right. Well, it's coming up here in a second. And then also charging the shield. Tell us about this. Yeah, so what you're seeing here okay. is, uh, is, is our dual wielding system. Um, basically, you, the player has two loadouts. And you can put uh, something in your offhand and, and a weapon Apesar in your da, primary da hand. Dos bonecos, and uh, uh, we allow the player to mix and match one-handed weapons. Um, and so, so right there, what you're seeing is your sword and board, right, going into it and trying to close the gap in the distance and, and having the ability to parry with your shield uh, and power attack uh, with your sword. So there was a shielded enemy and it felt like uh, the sword and board yeah. stopped working. Yeah. But then you also, right there, you pull somebody in yeah. a little, get over here. Get, talk talk yeah. to us about some of the different skills and, and ability. Yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's one of our ranged uh, units that basically is, is out in the, in the distance. You, you know, you're using into the fray, uh, which is a mechanic to allow yeah, you to pull the enemy caramba. closer to you. Um, you know, again, we have power attack, that's a blocker. That's essentially um, not, not, you know, your basic melee attacks are just not going to go through it. Um, so you're going to have to use your power attack to be able to break their block. Or you can swap to the wand if, it, if there's yeah. a shielded enemy, you know, you're not yeah. getting through to them. So how often in the game do you find maybe yourselves uh, through the experience? I, I'm much more a magic player. Yeah. I suspect I will be heading down like more of the wanded path, but clearly there's diversity with enemies and diversity yeah. in, in how you need to approach them. So can you talk about like how much you guys maybe in, in your play experiences have been swapping between them? Like what can we expect as players? Uh, we definitely try to have these mechanics that are common amongst most uh, weapons, but at the same time, uh, try to give the space across all the different weapon types. Um, so, you know, if you're using the wand, there's a lot of homing going on there. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, it's magic damage, it's going through their, you know, it's going through their armor and stuff like that. That's why I like it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, versus, you know, again, using uh, a melee weapon where you're gonna have to get closer to them. Yeah. So a little bit personal. Eu tô genuinamente gostando do combate vendo esse gameplay estendido aí por conta do, do, do uso da, do escudo e da, e da espada. Me parece que é o jeito que eu vou querer jogar. Por conta da mecânica parecer ser legal. Esse golpe carregado, essa, essa espadada dos dois lados que ele dá. É uma pena que os bonecos, os inimigos, eles têm um, 
um, um, uma animação esquisita às vezes, tanto quando eles recebem o um dano quanto eles morrem, mas acho que tem espaço, tem tempo para eles melhorarem isso daí, cara, acho que um jogo desse tamanho tem que ter um pouco mais de cuidado nesse aspecto aí, mas todo o resto eu tô achando muito legal, cara. Style yes. a little bit like what are the enemies you're actually dealing with in yeah. that moment? Yeah. One of the great things about the system that um, Gabe's team has been building though is it's very flexible um, and it supports players mixing and matching between oh, yeah. weapons, between ability trees. Um, Respecking is you know pretty easy for players who really want to try something mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. So when I'm playing, I, I kind of love to follow my sense of curiosity, and sometimes you'll find a new unique weapon with some pretty nice buffs on it, and maybe you'll decide to rock that for a while, um, even if it's not what you've been using previously. So there is a skill tree in this game? Yes. Yes, there is. Uh, okay, good. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I love a good, good skill tree, yeah. so oh, yes. it's good to, good to confirm that. One of the things we've done uh, in terms of skills in the tree is we've tried to, you know, a, a pillars are classes, right? Um, we wanted to be able to grab as many abilities from the trees as possible um, and sort of categorize them a little bit differently so that the player doesn't feel like they're locked into a single choice at the start of the game. They can kind of mix and match, you know, between different abilities. So you can get some, some you variety. can you have some variety. Mm -hmm. You can choose to kind of commit to being a fighter, right, per se, but we're not, it's not an enforced kind of class setup. And, and as Carrie said, you can respec if you don't yeah, like exactly. the direction yeah. you went down. Yeah. I love that. But there are definitely some pretty fun and wild combinations like, you know, you can do your traditional sword and board or, you know, play more of a magic wielder with a grimoire and a wand. Um, you know, but you can also take a pistol and a shield and just charge around the battlefield and fight characters at medium distance. And you can use some of the different abilities that you're seeing in this playthrough um, to support that flexibility. And on that note, too, um, dual wielding wands, I probably mentioned this last time we were in an interview together for Showcase Extended that I was so excited about it. And when I was down at Irvine, the team was very generous to let me play a very early build. And I got to experience the dual wielding wands. And it's so snappy and fun. It's exactly mm -hmm. what I was thinking it would be but I'm curious because we're seeing a little bit of that now um, where you have different uh, spell casting effects on each so I imagine there's probably some really incredible combos have you like seen some special combos yourselves or maybe what testers have have managed to pull off yeah definitely um, so you know with into the fray you could use like a fireball ability that creates like an AOE on the ground right and then pull the enemy into the fire I love and it. They, they land they get Devious. on fire um, <laughs> but in terms of the of the wands right like what you're seeing there is a is a, a sort of enchanted uh the wand and, you know, there are potentially other elements that you mm -hmm. can maybe find but pillars is you know really known for their unique weapons and and the unique per permutations of enchantments that you can kind of see on them so yeah so in this particular area i i did also get to play through this part and uh first i i realized you need to take out the healer first, otherwise it's like going down <laughs> yeah, yeah, and up yeah, escalator, yeah, yeah. you're not making yes. a lot of progress. Yes, yes, yes. But um, this is where I found that you really uh, start to put these things together. So mm. you, you froze that larger enemy. Mm. Um, so sort of talk about some of these elements and, and how you can even use them outside of combat. Yeah, so um, yeah, we have an elemental system where you can like uh, guys on fire, you can freeze them, you can shock them. Uh, we have you know objects in the world that the player can interact with. They're they're not just on weapons, right? They're not just on wands, right? You can you might find something with a sword that has it, right? Mm. Uh, a certain abilities might I'm cause elemental uh, damage. Also, your companions themselves, you know, could have potentially some damage there. That there was something when when uh, I had gotten a play where I wandered somewhere else yeah. and and ran into uh, an area that was gated off, mm -hmm. and and I was able actually to use that freeze yeah. to help uh, to progress in yes. the exploration. Yes, yeah, and so we have uh, objects like that. We also have you know maybe being able to burn brambles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can destroy destroy barriers to find new areas to explore. Yeah. You can freeze paths in the water to maybe reach ledges that you can't yeah. normally. Yeah. Um, lots of fun options there. And a lot of what we saw, like we saw a Tanglefoot ability, for instance, which was really cool oh, because when you're freezing an enemy, you're totally jeito, freezing them. But when you're trapping them with the Tanglefoot ability, like ranged attackers Caramba, can still get you. So there's, there's a lot of nuance there that as a player you have to consider. But also a lot that was built off of the Pillars of Eternity mm -hmm. universe, like Tanglefoot is directly um, associated from from those games. So I'm curious, like, how did you guys hone in on these abilities? Like, what are the combos you were thinking about? Anything that any 
anything that you brought over yeah. and maybe changed or, or made new to? Yeah, so for Tanglefoot, um, but because in, in an action first person game, it's all about movement and trying to like crowd control. Uh, for Tanglefoot, right, it's about also creating space. So we already had freezing, they're, they're, you're crowd controlling that way, but with Tanglefoot, it's, it's a little bit unique where they're rooted and so they can, they don't move, but they can still do attack. So uh, it's about trying to find that balance where you're not overpowering the enemy. And there's, again, choice and consequence for these, these mechanics um, so that the player just doesn't like just stomp everybody all the time, you know, so. Well, let's go back a little bit because we got an opportunity to talk about that very Obsidian style um, depth and breadth of gameplay. I have watched the developer direct so many times I've memorized all of your guys' <laughs> lines, so that, that is directly <laughs> lifted from there. Um, but there's another very Obsidian element um, to Avowed, which is branching dialogue and how you make choices within the story too. And Carrie, you alluded to some consequences potentially if you make one decision or another, but it's again, very much like playing your own way. So can you talk about just how impactful like those choices that you make are and, and that branching dialogue and how that can result in, in different paths for the player? Absolutely. So again, for us, um, creating these choices like the big ones that affect the outcome of a quest or you know, the well-being of certain characters or communities um, are just as important as the smaller choices that you make and navigating a dialogue and kind of you know, in subtle ways influencing your relationship with another character. But all of it is really centered around letting the player be the main character in this setting. Um, and so what we're seeing here is uh, you know, the players, they've been exploring, um, exploring this grotto. They're finding the bodies of these dead soldiers and kind of picking up pieces of a story along the way. And so here they finally found the survivor and um, talking through them about what happened and getting a... Esse personagem aqui, ele parece ser de uma raça... Não sei quem joga o Pillars of Eternity aí, mas ele tem alguma coisa diferente. Ele tem umas... Parece umas escamas, né? Se vocês conhecem aí esse tipo de, de, de classe ou coisa assim, comentem aí que eu fiquei curioso. A little bit more information. So there is a moment that's going to come up after this where the player can... Uh, Confront the guy who ran away. Um, Peraí, eu preciso dar uma olhada nessa cena aqui. Getting a little bit more information. So there. Ó, esse lugar aqui, ó, se tudo isso aqui foi explorável, eu acho que muita montanha é para limitar o cenário, né? Mas there is a moment that's o tamanho going to come desse after... cenário ele me empolga. Ele, ele parece ser cheio de lugares para você poder entrar, para você explorar. É, por exemplo, aqui, ó, tem um buraco que deve ser aquele lugar que ele passou nadando aqui, né? Isso tudo você acaba vendo de longe e você fica sempre curioso para explorar. Gosto muito desse tipo de gameplay. After this, where the player can uh, confront the guy who ran away um, design, né? and make a pretty impactful choice with him about how they decide to, to navigate that conversation. And they can either, uh, it's, it's very obvious that this guy was in over his head, and then they, they can either sympathize with him and console him a little bit, or challenge him for his cowardice and for the way he abandoned his unit. Um, and the way the player navigates that conversation definitely has big consequences for how uh, that encounter plays out. So you mentioned your player being the, you know, the main character, mm -hmm. but they're not the solo character. Yeah. We see in this conversation, uh, Giada and Kai, I want to say. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the relationship with companions and how they interact both in the story and in, in uh, gameplay? Over the story. Sure. So, you know, your companions are your, your traveling partners in your journey through the living lands. Um, they all have deep... Esse, o Kai, né, que é o personagem que é o nosso companion, esse daqui, ele well, parece ser... You know, ser... your companions are your, your traveling partners aqui. in your journey through the living lands. How they interact oh, both... Ele parece ser da me... do mesmo jeito de pele do outro personagem laranja, né? Isso lembra muito Mass Effect pra mim também. Mass Effect tem muito personagem colorido, né? Saudades Mass Effect. Vou jogar de novo, logo, logo. É... E ele também tem essa pele meio escamosa, né? Isso tudo eu gostaria de entender. Parece um lizards, não sei. Mas algum tipo de classe que tenha relação com, com uma mescla aí, com algum animal, né? Muito interessante. In the story and in, Só que um é azul in, ou uh, verde, o outro é Sure. So, laranja, you know, your companions vermelho. are your, your traveling partners in your journey through the living lands. Um, they all have deep ties to different regions of the living lands, and they all have their own personal reasons um, for wanting to ally with the player and help them resolve uh, the big conflicts that you're encountering over the course of the game. So they're your, your allies, in some ways your advisors, your local guides, um, and they provide a lot of additional commentary and context that reveals something 
something both about their character, but also about the corner of the world that you're exploring. Um, and Kai in particular has a pretty deep history with Shatterscarp that comes out a little bit over the course of this quest as he starts to see how the region and the people have changed in his absence and maybe where he let them down. Um, but obviously they're also your allies in battle and that's something that Gabe can speak to. Yeah, so for, for the companions, we, we wanted to make sure that they had their role uh, in, 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 the, in the combat systems. And so, you know, again, like I talked about, uh, Kai can uh, help you with the burning brambles, and um, and Giada is a, is healing, right? And so mm. Kai's kind of your tank. He he has an ability mm. that's called taunt, uh, or it's not called taunt, but it's a taunt, and it, uh, a taunt allows you to basically uh, make the enemy uh, take aggression from them and, and start to focus on on Kai, uh, and then Giada can have the ability to heal your party. Um, so yeah, just they have they have impact in combat as well. Yeah. Should we it assume there will be other companions Kai. throughout the game as well? Yes, you, the, you, you'll meet a couple more. Um, Kai and Giada are just two of them. Okay. Very I just know much. Obsidian known for some yes, pretty exactly. great companions. Mm -hmm. I was going to say the years. same thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's certainly an expectation. But it, you mentioned Shatterscarp. I'm already like really sad for Kai, and I already mm -hmm. want to console him because mm -hmm. I feel like you know there's some, some history to uncover there. But what is Shatterscarp? That's obviously where we are mm -hmm. in, in this mission, in this extended um, footage that we've been seeing from Developer Direct. What is the context to Shatterscarp that we should know? Yeah, so as you can see, it's a it's a very arid environment. Um, a lot of the locals who have settled here are originally from Rawatai, which returning Pillars players will recognize as kind of this um, this very fun but somewhat militaristic culture, um, which Kai originally comes from as well. So you've got this sort of very hardy little settlement um, on the cliffs overlooking the coast called Thirdborn. Um, but what the player encounters here is a ramp up in tensions between their people, the Adiran Empire, um, and the locals. Um, again, here primarily uh, settled around tie-ins, um, as everybody's sort of trying to negotiate some conflicts that are taking place um, and you know starting to grow in the living lands. You're also seeing uh, the the stronger effects of something called the Dream Scourge, which is the spiritual plague that you've been sent here to investigate. And just to add into that mix, we've also got uh, an archmage who has taken up one corner of the map and created her own little um, frozen labyrinth there. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of different characters, a lot of different tensions um, to navigate and that the player's going to get to encounter here. Carrie, stop. You're saying too much. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we're noticing just with the, the player, they're mantling their way through. It's a very vertical area. Mm -hmm. And there was actually one part of the footage where they, they look down and there's enemies there, and they choose not to engage. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you could just talk about like the, the size of this area and just like how um, how that affords the ability to like choose even just what to engage with and what not Your to. Your literal path. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, uh, it's open zone, right? So uh, comparable to Outer Worlds areas on the larger side. Um, and multiple paths, uh, essentially, to be able to tackle uh, combat situations. Um, or avoid them. Or avoid them, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, this area is entirely discoverable, which means it's also entirely missable. Um, and I really want to give a shout out to uh, Tyler McCombs, who's the uh, the area designer who uh, set up the little grotto we're exploring. Um, as you mentioned, there's a wonderful sense of verticality, um, just a lot of wonderful nooks and crannies to explore. Um, and that's something that we really wanted to, to take advantage of and also set up, as Gabe mentioned, really fun combat encounters around that let you either just, you know, jump in, charge right in, or take a more tactical um, and measured approach. And you see that even in this first combat that you encounter when you, you know, you dive through that skull's mouth and you, you come up out of the mouth. water. Um, our play tester here takes the, the rightmost path, which is the sneak one, but you can also just, you know, Leroy Jenkins your way up the middle <laughs> and just jump right into the fray. I love that. Well, we got so much additional detail um, in this podcast. Really appreciate you both joining us. But before we wrap up, we have just a couple more questions, too. Um, developer Direct is like an interesting show for us because we hand over complete reins to the, the, you, the developers, wanting to give you all an opportunity to talk about the craft, the very obsidian craft in, in your guys' case, um, that goes into the game and, and how the team thinks about things when you're putting things together. So I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about that kind of team culture and also both of your roles. Like, how do they integrate? What does a creative director do? What does a gameplay director do? And what's your day-to-day -day working together like to, to bring this game together to life? Nossa. Isso é uma coisa que eu acho bem legal no, no, no formato que, a, que, a, que o Xbox está fazendo, que é você, você ter uma visão mais próxima do que é cada um dos estúdios, né? E, e eles, com o tipo de programa começo do podcast que eles estão fazendo, eles dão oportunidades da gente conhecer mais ainda do estúdio. 
novamente, é, eu não conhecia o trabalho da diretora, vou, vou, vou procurar mais, talvez seja alguém que era bem mais conhecido aí pra vocês, mas eu não sabia que o jogo era uma diretora, eu vou, vou, vou percorrer um pouco mais do que a carreira dela, né? E talvez a gente só saiba mais dessas coisas por conta desses tipos de abordagem que o Xbox vem fazendo. Eu acho que isso é bem legal, que é dar espaço e, 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 e voz pros estúdios. Eu acho que a, a vitrine que é o Xbox vai fazer muita diferença na vida de todos esses produtores, de todos os estúdios que fazem parte dentro do, dos estúdios Xbox. Viu? Sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as the as the game director on the project, I'm responsible for setting out the vision and, you know, helping to guide the team and all of our different efforts towards that um, and make sure that we're really building a cohesive and exciting player experience. Um, and, you know, both the joy and the challenge of that is, you know, RPGs are so feature rich and so content rich. We have so many different systems supporting our combat, our exploration, um, and then there's the way we build quests, the way we seed them through the world the way we try to nudge players towards them without being too heavy-handed about it. And so, you know, I'm always trying to, to, we're always trying to balance how these elements work together to, again, create a, an experience that's cohesive and consistent, but also allow room for surprises and nuance and fun, um, you know, and not, not get so, so precious about the dogma of what we're building that we don't allow for those, those expressions of creativity and those things that, you know, we as developers love to create and we know players are going to love to find. Yeah, from uh, as my role in ga as gameplay director, uh, you know, I'm trying to uh, direct a you know team for uh, that's kind of more revolved around uh, conversations, exploration, uh, and and combat. Right, that's kind of like kind of a, the big over overseen uh, parts of the game, and just working uh, with with Carrie to just make sure that we're we're following our pillars. Uh, you know, if you will, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. No following, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> following our pillars, and you know, you know, having little. Uh, 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 back and forth fights, right, about, mm -hmm. you know, whether the blocker should be holding a shield or mm -hmm. the blocker should be holding a, a spear. You were absolutely right, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, so, um, but yeah, just just uh, making sure that we're working together um, to be able to, like, to get the gameplay features that are fun, make sure it fits in the lore, make sure it fits part of the world, make sure we're not doing anything that's maybe doesn't fit within the Obsidian brand, right, like things that are, mechanics that are too binary, right, and, and more, a little bit more, Uh, less black and white and a little bit more like uh, how RPG players would like them to be. So, yeah. And one cool. of the great things about our studio culture is, you know, so many of us are RPG fans. And I feel like one of the real strengths of being a mid-sized developer is we are, you know, just large enough to be ambitious with the gameplay and the content we build, but also, you know, small enough that we can still be nimble and again, still, um, you know, allow people to take big swings. And uh, the Leviathan Hollow that we see in this con in the, the, this playthrough is a really great example of that. Mm. Um, originally, it was scoped to be much smaller. Um, and again, we found that the area designer, Tyler, who was working on that was had a schedule, things were going great, and so his producer and his lead kind of, you know, looked at the schedule and said, yeah, if you want, you've got time to make something more out of this, and we've got an excellent showpiece here that, again, is, you know, a wonderful combination of, you know, strong planning and coordination on the production side, to be sure, but also just some really great initiative, um, you know, from the team. So there's something I've been wondering since... Isso aí que ela falou é muito interessante. É, a gente espera dos estúdios Xbox internos é... Acho que o, o, o mercado inteiro né, espera paridade com, com o que, as a, com que a concorrência faz. A Nintendo tem os seus estúdios e eles têm um limite gráfico que eles podem chegar. Mas em todos os outros aspectos técnicos, eles são muito bons. Menos a Game Freak que faz o Pokémon, que eu acho que eles são uma vergonha. Todo o resto é excelente. O, a Playstation, todos os estúdios da Playstation são muito bons. A gente pode questionar a Band Studios em alguns momentos por causa do Days Gone alguns outros é, estúdios mais antigos, mas dos últimos, né, Guerrilla e todos os outros estúdios, Santa Mônica, Naughty Dog, eles são excelentes, assim, em termos técnicos. Mas a gente vê que eles são estúdios grandes, são considerados estúdios grandes, com um porte financeiro muito alto. O, o que a diretora do jogo falou agora é que a Obsidian é um estúdio de médio porte e que ela vê que eles são pequenos comparado com o mercado e tudo mais. Não sei quantos funcionários eles possuem. Mas isso é uma coisa legal de se notar, que talvez que possa determinar que o Xbox, ao inserir... Isso também se confunde bastante com o Hellblade. O Xbox, quando compra um estúdio, insere ele dentro da sua estratégia, ele não vai transformar esse estúdio em um estúdio gigante, porque ele foi adquirido, como aconteceu com a Insomniac lá e, e com a Playstation. Ele vai dar suporte para que o estúdio continue a sua evolução gradativa, pelo menos é isso que está dando para notar. 
E aí as cobranças visuais, né, técnicos de alguns aspectos, podem acabar tendo efeitos diferentes em cada um dos estúdios. É o que eu vejo com a Obsidian nesse momento. Por mais que para muita gente a Obsidian seja um estúdio gigantesco. E eles trabalham como um estúdio gigantesco, né? eles fazem jogos muito bons. Mas talvez não seja do tamanho que a gente pensa que é. Até pela fala da própria diretora, né? Um estúdio de médio porte. Isso vai ficar na minha cabeça por muito tempo, porque a maneira com que a gente julga as coisas, e não é por maldade, é, é, é pela maneira com que as coisas são, geralmente, né? Não, é, você espera que um estúdio de first party, um estúdio interno, ele passe a ter uma, um aporte, não somente financeiro, mas técnico também, que possa é, criar nele uma grandeza, uma, uma questão técnica também mais apurada. E pelo visto o Xbox vai manter cada um dos estúdios no mesmo patamar que eles estavam e eles vão crescendo gradativamente, mas com uma segurança maior do que ser sozinho, né? Do que ser um estúdio independente. Acho que é nessa vibe aí. Vamos ver o que mais eles vão falar. A Valve was first, uh, first revealed a few years back with that teaser. And, and that is like, what can we glean from the title? When I think of like a Valve, like you, you can vow revenge, you can be a, a enemies. It feels like very personal. I'm just curious like what we can, what we can take away from the title as we I want more right yeah. now but this is all we're going to get today <laughs> yeah. but, but just, just what can we what can we be thinking about here so I won't say too much this time Gabe, <laughs> but um yeah so as the the player character you're the envoy so you're a representative of the Adiran Empire you are the personal representative of the Emperor himself and you're sent here on this mission to investigate the spiritual plague so on the one hand you're vowed to the Emperor nice and the Empire you that you serve um, but while you're in the living lands you might discover another unique connection uh, to something else that's that's very close to you. So this game is very much about um, choosing your loyalties and uh, choosing what matters most to you. And that's all I'll say about this. <laughs> all right. Well, I know what matters most to me is getting to play this game. Um, we'll talk more about that, but we're, you, we will hear a little bit more because coming up, I want to say this Sunday, Carrie, you're going to be on Drop Frames with JP and Co and Ezekiel. So make sure you tune into that. Anything else like before we let you go, though, that you want to talk about? I, I just can't wait for players to jump into the Living Lands for themselves and explore all that it has to offer. Again, one of the most, uh, one of the big delights of being a developer on a game like this is creating so much for players to find and knowing that not everybody's going to seek it out and not everybody's going to find it, but knowing that the players who do are really going to enjoy the secrets they discover. I know that we've talked about a lot of stuff, but it's still just... Just a slice. <laughs> yeah, just yes. a slice. Yeah. There you go. I want it. I, I know. It. Yes, absolutely. And we, we did get an opportunity to dive in a little bit deeper. Mm. So thank you both. Well, é isso. Eles terminaram aí. Bom, é, dá pra gente perceber que eles estão bastante confia confiantes e, e contentes com o rumo do projeto, né? É, a gente nota também que eles sabem é, muito bem o, o, o limite que eles têm em alguns aspectos, mas que eles acabam superando o limite com algumas coisas criativas. É isso que a gente espera de um jogo como esse. Cara, eu, eu tô bastante ansioso pelo Avald. Eu, eu acho que o meu hype de, diminuiu um pouco do que tava no começo. É... Mas talvez isso seja bom pra gente poder ter uma noção melhor de como é o projeto, né? Porque o primeiro teaser, ele realmente deixou uma sensação de que a gente tava diante de um jogo enorme, é... uma vibe pra ser concorrente de um, de um grande RPG, do um Skyrim da vida. E um passo absurdo da Obsidian. Mas parece, na verdade, ser um passo, um passo controlado, mas um passo para frente. É, é isso que eu tive a sensação. Acho que eles precisam melhorar ainda algumas coisas relacionadas aos inimigos. Isso eu já falei em outro vídeo. Mas esse, esse gameplay novo aí deu pra gente ver um pouco mais dos cenários do jogo. E dá pra ver que a exploração é extremamente importante. Isso pra mim é uma das coisas mais divertidas de videogame. Você explorar, ter essa sensação de curiosidade, desconhecido, recompensa. Espero que tudo isso esteja dentro desse jogo aí. Bom, galera, um vídeo longo, porque eu não quis pegar só os detalhezinhos, eu preferi acompanhar todas as falas dos produtores. Espero que vocês tenham gostado, foi uma estreia para vocês aí, que estreou um pouquinho tarde, mas que pode ter valido a pena para vocês também. Espero que vocês possam interagir e deixar o seu gostei aí, porque ajuda demais. Se inscreve no canal também, beleza? Valeu, fui!